guys, as promised, um, I am going to run through this Astran test with you guys. This is a submaximal exercise test. And I told you after the end of the last lecture that I was going to try to do my best to tie these pieces together with you, for you, uh, beside you, without having a lab in which we can do this work in. So um, I put together some slides and um, I got some pictures and some video clips and things like that that we can talk about. And hopefully this kind of, in addition to the lecture, in addition to the videos, kind of ties all these pieces together. So um, teaching lab components without a lab is a very interesting work. So um, we're just going to kind of go through this verbatim and I just want you to have it. And um, we're going to talk about this test. So basically, the Astran test is a sub-maximal cycle ergometer aerobic fitness test. All right, so put all that together. And um, it's based upon the relationship between heart rate during work and the work intensity and maximal heart rate. So if I were to kind of plot this out on a graph for you guys, if I have, let's go over here, I have my Y and my X. I probably did not choose the best color. Let me do this again. Let's do, where's pen color? There we go. Black should show up pretty well. Um, if I were to kind of graph this out, right? And I had uh, work rate here. I'm just going to put WR. And that kind of stands for intensity, right? So we have zero very low intensity to let's just pick easy numbers 100 very high intensity and over here on the x-axis i had heart rate right and we can say zero heart rate meaning you're dead and let's just say 300 beats per minute right which is way above anyone's age predicted heart rate max so what happens is this test is based upon this relationship with work rate and heart rate and it helps to determine a vo2 max score without stressing the body right so what happens is as we begin to work and we increase the intensity of work over time well with that increase in intensity we have an increase in heart rate and this is a linear relationship between the two right so if this is let's say this is uh, 120 beats per minute right here all right that's well above resting heart rate. That's double than most people's resting heart rate. Well, if I increase the intensity to, let's say we're doing watts, right? Let's say this is 50 watts. Pretty hard to pedal on 50 watts. Here's 100 watts. What that tells me is that if I get to 50 watts and I draw this line that kind of connects these two variables, what happens is that if I increase intensity, I naturally increase heart rate in a linear fashion right so you can see that that's there's a linear relationship there if i went up to 75 right here's that's a 75 and let's say this is uh 200 right here again i'm drawing with my right hand so just bear with me that's a 200 zero, zero. um well if i increase the intensity then likewise heart rate will increase with that intensity and you can see here that they meet at this point right here right and if I draw that line going down here, right, it meets at 200. So what this test is based upon and this calculation is based upon is we're trying to keep our heart rate within a certain range. And that range is going to be between, let's say, 65 to 85% of your, your maximum heart rate, right? So we're going to keep it somewhere um, above 110 beats per minute. Right. So we're going to keep it above that, something greater than that. And then we're going to that's going to be the basement. And then the ceiling is going to be whatever your 85 percent of your maximum heart rate is. Right. Because that's sub maximal work. So we're going to keep it somewhere between 110 and whatever your your 85 percent of your maximum heart rate is, because anything that goes past that 85 percent. Let me just change the color here. Um, anything that goes past 85% is no longer submaximal workout. Then anything above 85 and higher, we're getting into maximum workout, maximum heart rate. Okay. So that's how this test, that's what this test is based upon is this relationship between intensity 
and heart rates. So I'm just going to read this for you guys. So um, this can be used to assess the cardiorespiratory fitness of your participant without all that expensive equipment. All you need is a bike and a couple of other things. And I'll show you what you need. And you, you've already seen it on the videos. And we're using this to estimate the VO2 max of your participant without adding the discomfort and the risk associated with maximal exercise testing, right? So this test would be good if you're in a, in a location where you don't have the right equipment or if you're kind of unsure about uh, the, the risk level of working with a certain participant, or let's say you wanted to get a VO2 score of your athlete before a big game on Saturday. And you're like, oh, well, I wonder, I wonder what his VO2 score is right now. Well, if you don't want to max them out and fatigue them before the big game, then you'll run one of these tests and you can do a submaximal exercise where you can get the information without really stressing their body out too much. So we can use it in that caliber or in that manner as well. Okay. So there's, there's lots of great uses for this type of, um, this type of, I'm trying to erase all this cause it's, it's driving me mad, um, for this type of, uh, testing. Okay. So let's move on to the next slide. So, um, I wanted to add this and this is something I also, um, something I also noted on in these, uh, the videos that you guys were watching is, um, I liked some of these videos that I gave you because it's showing the total procedure. So the test isn't just the test, right? We're not just putting somebody on a bike and saying, okay, do this so I can get information on you. We also have to do those other things that we focused on in chapter one and chapter two, which is kind of doing some data collection, right? Getting background information to determine what that risk factor is, right? We spent a lot of time in the first chapter talking about the PARQ plus the medical history. Um, I showed you that in chapter two, we did that uh, ACSM um, test where we kind of asked those questions and we, we uh, I'll throw that up here so you guys can see it. Um, but their algorithm where we can determine what the risk level is of somebody that um, may have um, symptoms of a disease or may not have symptoms. Um, which is that one right here, right? That was that um, pre-participation screening algorithm. So we want to make sure we screen them so we know what we are doing. We know what is going on with this individual. And then we also want to get, it's super, super important with this test. We want to get resting heart rate and we want to get resting blood pressure. Um, and since this particular test is on a cycle, uh, right? It's on one of these Monarch bikes or stationary bike or whatever. Um, since it's on a, a bike or an ergometer, we, we can adjust the resistance. It's real easy to have somebody's arm just kind of sitting here, right? They're holding on to the handlebars, right? And then we just slap a blood pressure cuff on them. And then we can take blood pressure uh, while they're exercising, right? And we got the little gauge here that tells us what the blood pressure is. So that's like, that's one of the great things about this test is we can get heart rate my right hand is getting stronger. I can feel it. And we can get blood pressure and we can get, that's a BP. We can get this information while they're cycling. And since heart rate is so important in this particular test, we're going to want to make sure that we take frequent, frequent heart rate uh, assessments. Um, and I'll tell you why when, when we get to that momentarily. Okay. So again, we want to get background information. We want to get um, informed consent. Very, very important. Um, and we want to make sure that these individuals are not high risk. Um, once we have that informed consent, once we did the par Q, once we've determined that these people are not risk or low risk, then what we want to do is we want to have them sit quietly in a chair. And we want to do that for about five to 10 minutes. Why do we want to do that? Well, when you stand up, when you speak, when you turn the lights on, when you walk around, you are having real time changes in heart rate, fluctuations in blood pressure and changes in metabolism, right? So if you're sitting down and then you stand up and you walk to the door, you're immediately shifting from primarily aerobic metabolism to now bringing in glucose and glycogen, uh, not glycogen, uh, but anaerobic and aerobic glycolysis into the picture because you're using different fibers and you went from sitting to standing. Um, so any sort of perturbations in um, the body 
outside of sitting in a chair will change our results. It'll change metabolism. It will change blood pressure. It will change heart rate. Um, so we want to make sure that we have somebody sit down in a chair, five to 10 minutes, no talking, just relaxing. And we want to get them down to essentially their basal state, their basal resting metabolic state. Um, and once they're there, then we will get heart rate. We can do heart rate either through a, um, we can do it through a heart rate monitor. If you have ECGs and you want to use that, you can do that. Or if you just want to um, take check their pulse and you can do it for 60 seconds, you can do it for 30 seconds and multiply it by two. You can do it for 10 seconds, multiply it by six. Um, however you want to do that, you can get heart rate. Uh, blood pressure test. We want to make sure that we are taking blood pressure. And we also want to make sure that when we exercise, um, we should not be doing anything that increases the blood pressure over 200 um, in systolic breath, blood pressure and 110 over in diastolic blood pressure. So if we kind of get over those values, um, we need to terminate the test. Um, and then, of course, we're going to record this information on a data sheet. If we were in the lab, I would give you a data sheet. Um, if we were in a lab, you would be conducting this th these tests here. Unfortunately, we're not in a lab. Um, so we just have to kind of make this kind of our virtual learning experience. Um, so once we have heart rate, you guys know how to do that. We talked about that. You guys have watched videos on blood pressure tests. Of course, we haven't done them, um, but you know what that looks like. Uh, then we would record that information on a data sheet. And also we would tell our subjects or our patients or our participants not to consume coffee and or smoke for 30 minutes prior to this test. Because again, um, these things will alter metabolism, alter blood pressure, alter heart rate. So when we begin to set up the bike, we got to take, we got to take, um, we have to be critical about a couple of things with the setup. So let's talk about that. Okay. So, um, I have this image here and we're not going to spend too much time on it because it really does no good if we're not, uh, in the lab and kind of doing this with our partners, but, um, we want to make sure that the seat height on the cycle ergometer, uh, is at a level where there is a slight bend of the knee. And this is about five to a 15% degree bend. Um, and we want to make sure we do this when the pedal crank arm is perpendicular to the floor. So that means not this one here, right? You guys, um, so I'm sorry about that. Not, um, this foot back here, that's not perpendicular to the floor, right? We want to do it on this one here where um, the pedal is hovering slightly uh, above the floor. And you can see here that um, this, there's a 15, this is probably about a 12 and a half degree angle right here. So the knee is almost straight, but we just want this kind of slight bend here. And that's what's going to give us our best results. So we want to adjust the seat so that uh, we are um, almost, almost straight legged. And then we want to make sure that um, this performance, again, we want to measure resting heart rate and we want to keep in track. We want to keep track of blood pressure, right? So where we can kind of start calibrating this um, is during the warm up. So before they start warming up, make sure you have your resting heart rate, right? Your pre resting heart rate. Um, when they start warming up, we're going to take heart rate again. As you can see here, have the participants start warming up about five to 10 minutes, however, um, however long you think they need. And then we'll take our blood pressure, right? Make sure that we're capable of reading uh, the blood pressure while they're on the bike, right? So there's our blood pressure cuff. Um, if they have a heart rate monitor, they might have one here, right? If they have an Apple watch or they might have one across the chest, or you might just take their pulse, right? Right, right around there. Um, and we want to make sure that all these things are synchronized before we start taking the test, because if we don't have these things synchronized, we're not going to get useful data. Um, so let's talk a little bit about workload now. So we have a couple different settings, uh, with workload. And um, what I want you to look at here is we have conditioned, I'm sorry, unconditioned and conditioned workload. And that would be for males. So when we talk about this workload, we're going to talk about uh, either watts, right? Which is 98 watts and 39 watts. 
or we're going to talk about this kilograms per meter per meter per minute, right? And that would be these higher numbers, 300 kilograms per meter per minute or 900 kilograms per meter per minute. And that kind of uh, translates into 49 watts and 98 watts. Um, now, this is the intensity that we're going to set. This is the, the ceiling and the, the ceiling and the basement and where we're going to set this intensity to try to get a steady state heart rate. So that looks like this H R and then two small S's. And again, we want to get their heart rate within a certain zone. So in order to manipulate the heart rate to get it to a steady state, we're going to either increase intensity or decrease intensity. And if you look at conditioned males, it starts at a much higher wattage and it ends at a much higher wattage, or in this case, it ends at a much higher um, kilogram per meter per minute. Women, 300 to 450, so we have 49 watts and 74 watts. Conditioned women, 74 watts and 98 watts, or 450 kilograms per meter per minute to 600 kilograms per meter per minute. So this is where we want to start trying to kind of get into that right zone. So use this table to the right to determine what workloads should be used for the test. Record your selected workload on the data sheet. We don't have the data sheet. Now, um, in the um, last lecture, I had told you that we can convert watts to kilograms per meter. And how that works is one watt is the equivalent to 6.12 kilograms per meter per minute. So there's that conversion factor, right? So if I were to ask you a question, somebody's doing um, 70 watts, right? 70 watts, I would say how many kilograms per meter per minute is that? And you would just say, okay, 70 times, that's a times, that's an X, 6.12, and that will give you the conversion factor to do kilograms kg per meter per minute all right so there's that conversion factor real easy it's not not hard math at all um and this is where we are going to kind of set up this test to get the to get the right heart rate that we want we want to stay within a certain range of heart rate let's move to the next slide so the other thing you should do is during the warm up, you should ask your subject, and here's a script down here, um, to tell you what their rate of perceived exertion is. So, again, we want to pay attention to heart rate. We want to pay attention to blood pressure. We want to pay attention to RPE, rate of perceived exertion. Oh, that was a terrible P. That was an RPE. Okay, there we go. Rate of perceived exertion. And um, we know that six, it's not on here, it got cut off. Six is very easy and 20 is very hard, right? This test, we should not really go over 10 or 11, right? It's a submax test. And this test not only is submaximal, but it's also consistent. We're not, this isn't a staged or um, a ramp protocol test. We're keeping it at a very very specific pace. All right. So um, during the warm up, they should say, oh, I'm at about six or seven. And then during the test, maybe there will be somewhere in between 10 and 12. Right. And, you know, nine is this is pretty easy. Eleven is uh, this is light. And then once we get near 13, then we're kind of getting into the somewhat hard. So uh, that would be RPE rate of perceived exertion. So you want to ask them that as well during the warm up and also during the test. Now, after we warm up, we are going to set the workload or the resistance to the predetermined level. All right. So is it 300? Is it 600? I'm not even going to try to drive that because it's not coming out well. Um, is it 900? What, where are they going to be? Um, we also want to have an estimation of what our heart rate ranges are. So on the previous lecture, I showed you guys, um, we did maximum heart rate, right? Which was 220 minus age. And that tells us what our age predicted maximum heart rate is, right? 
and then I told you that we can do uh, we can take that and we can get percentages so what is 60% of that right what is 70% of that and I showed you some calculations and if you guys don't remember that you need to go back into that last lecture and look at that so what is 85 percent of our maximum heart rate because that's where we want to be under on this test and I'm not going to go through that with you guys because I want you to go back and I want you to look that up all right so we need to know what our 85 percent of our max heart rate is and I'm just going to draw an 85 here right and we want to stay under that we want to stay under 85 percent of our max heart rate we want to stay below that okay so we're going to set the work rate we're going to provide the participant with any necessary last minute reminders okay um and then we're going to tell them that you know this what this test should include and here's kind of the script on that you will remain seated you can read all that and if you feel dizzy you can so here is what you are going to do during this test you will monitor the participants for any signs or symptoms of um, stress or any for any reason they'll need to stop the test uh, if any signs or symptoms arrive they should be recorded on the data sheet with the exercise time and workload that would have elicited response so if uh, you have the bike set at 450 um, kilograms per meter per minute and it induces a response you need to write that information down in when it had happened um, we are going to measure and record heart rate during the last 15 seconds of each minute this test has six minutes we go into the end of the six minutes so that means you will have six heart rate monitor or six heart rate um, rates recorded on your data sheet we will uh, basically ask them about the rate of perceived exertion at the same time the last 15 minutes of each last 15 seconds of each minute and then we will start to measure blood pressure at 230 and 530 marks of the test all right so we will get it at the early onset of the test and then we will also do it um, at the very end of the test and then of course you should be um, encouraging your participant now also you need to inform them that he or she will attempt to maintain a steady state heart rate between 120 and 170 beats per minute to ensure test validity um, the test can be stopped if the client exceeds 85 percent of the age predicted maximum heart rate or can't maintain the cadence and i will explain to you what a cadence is in a moment okay so that's why we have to determine uh 85 percent of maximum heart rate because we don't want them to exceed that that means the heart is working too hard for a steady state um exercise test and that means we need to terminate it now the test is completed at the six minute mark uh, unless your participants final heart rate is 125 less than 125 or greater than 170. now if it is less than or greater than that beats per minute then the workload should be adjusted and the test should be extended by six minutes so we're going to use we're, we're going to end the test at the six minute mark Here is some general indications to stop the test. Uh, you guys can read that. You guys should be very, very familiar, familiar with this because it basically applies to each and every test that we do in the lab. Um, and let's kind of get into some of the pictures I have for you now. So what I had said to you guys before about cadence is your pedal rate. So now I have a couple of sequence pictures here that I want to show you just to kind of bring more of this together for you. So you can see um, here we have the pedal rate. So we're going to try to keep the subject at 50 uh, revolutions per minute. So that is what the pedal rate is. So that's the cadence, right? Um, and then we have the heart rate monitor down here. And we're going to say that we're going to see that this one stays fairly constant and this one's going to increase right and here's why let me let me just kind of come let's uh talk about this for a second here as i said uh let's find an area where i can draw this uh, here let's just do it here 
as I said, heart rate and work rate are linear. Okay. So what we're going to see in the first part of this test, and here you can see it's two seconds. We're going to see, um, she went from rest to an increased work rate. And let's just say she's doing this at 60 Watts. Let's just put a 60 here, right? And we see that heart went from resting heart rate to 117 beats per minute. Okay. So she's at 117. Okay. So we know that there was an increase in work and there was an increase in heart rate. Now, this is a steady state test. So somewhere between here, 117, and her 85% age predicted 85% of her age predicted heart rate, she will plateau and her heart rate will look like this. And that is, that is heart rate steady state or steady state heart rate. So let's, let's look and see what this looks like. So she just started the test. She's two seconds in. We can see that her resting heart rate was probably 60 or 70 beats per minute. And now she's at 117 and she's only two seconds in and she's keeping this, this cadence of 50 revolutions per minute. So now let's move on to the next one. This next slide is a minute and six seconds in and look at this. She's still keeping that same pedal rate. So she's at 51. So we got a slight fluctuation, but look what happened to her heart rate. Now she's at 127. Okay. So she is still increasing in heart rate. And again, eventually it's going to level off. So let's see where that happens. So she's a minute in, that means they already took one of her heart rate measurements, right? We want to do it the last 15 seconds of every minute and she, and they did one rate of perceived exertion. Okay. And she's not pedaling very hard, right? She's way 127. She's way under, she's 23. She's way under her age predicted maximum heart rate. So this isn't strenuous for her at all. Okay. Let's go on to the next one, which would be a minute and 59 seconds. And I grab this one here because remember, take the heart rate, take the rate of perceived exertion. And you can see she's at 53. So she's right around that 50 mark and she's gone up to 131. Now, if memory serves me correctly, I think she levels out at 131. So she's going to maintain that 131 for the rest of the test. Okay. Um, but we will do heart rate again. We'll do rate of perceived exertion. And then let's move on to another one. So I took another picture at 247. So let's see how she's doing there. At 247, she is at 50 revolutions per minute still. And look what happened here. A minute after that last one, she's still at 132. So she has now leveled out. She has obtained her heart rate steady state or her steady state heart rate. And if we look at the next slide at 354, 130. She's still at that. She's still lingering at that 130 range. If we look at, and again, her pedal rate is, she's right around 50. That's where that's okay. If we look at the next slide, it's five minutes in she's at 56. So that tells me that this is kind of getting easier for her. So she's in shape. Her heart rate is at 132. She's maintaining that heart rate. And then when we get at 530, getting ready to conclude the test, she's at 134. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take the heart rate for the last two stages, which I've seen this taught both ways. Some people do minute five and minute four. Some people do minute five and a little bit into minute six. Um, so we're going to take the last or the final two heart rates. So I put this text down here. Um, again, we're going to get blood pressure and we're going to get heart rate. The test is complete at the six minute mark, unless your patient's heart rate is less than 125 beats per minute or greater than 170 beats per minute. If their heart rate is outside of 125 and 170, the workload should be adjusted and the test should be extended. So that means it's either too hard or too easy. All right. So now let, what do we do after the test? So I hope this kind of draws a, a clearer picture for you. We're going to allow the patient to cool down as long as they, as long as they need to, you're going to stay with your participant to make sure they're okay. Uh, heart rate and blood pressure should be assessed again. Um, and then we're going to use the results to predict our 
participants VO2. So let's take a look at this. And right now I just have some fictitious data up here. Um, we are going to use this chart right here. Okay. This nomogram. It's very uh, confusing looking at first, but it's pretty easy to use. So we have a female and we set the workload at 98 Watts or at 600 kilograms per minute. So let's go back really quick because I gave you guys that chart. Let's look at that chart. That, that for uh, a woman, she's very conditioned, right? We set it at 600. We could have set it at 500. We, we, so we have to kind of play with these numbers a little bit to figure out what is the right resistance for them. And that's why we say, okay, are you conditioned? Are you not conditioned? Do you work out a lot? Do you not work out a lot? So we set it at 600, which is pretty high. Um, she is a conditioned individual and um, steady state heart rate was 144. Now this is fictitious. This isn't, this isn't information from her per se. I'm just giving you random numbers so you can see how this works. And we grabbed um, heart rate at five minutes, which we knew was um, with the last one, it was 132. So I'm going to say on this one, it was 142 minute five. And then we took a heart rate somewhere into minute six. So maybe right after we, we right before we stopped the test and let's say she was at 146. So what we're going to do now is we're going to get the average of these two heart rates, the one for minute five and the one for minute six. And essentially that's going to tell us what our steady state heart rate was, right? So we're going to take an average of the two. Now, as you saw in these pictures, we had some fluctuations in heart rate, right? We had 130, 132, um, 132, 127. So we had some fluctuations, but they were hanging out in, in that basic area, right? Let's look at this next slide here and, and see how we're going to use this information together. So here again, I have the same information and I told you the heart rate at 140 at five minutes was 142 and the heart rate at six minutes was 146. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an average of those two numbers and that's going to give us our steady state heart rate. And you can see that I put that right here, heart rate, steady state, right? So we take 142 plus 146 and we get 288 and we divide that by two because that's how we get an average. There's two numbers, right? This one and this one. So we take this plus this, it gives us a whole number. And then we take that whole number and divide it by two. So we have heart rate steady state at 144. Now, here is what we are going to do with that information. Let me get a pen here. This is how we determine someone's, or we estimate someone's heart rate using this test. This is, this is the cool part. Let me get a different color because there's a green thing there and I don't want to use green. And the guys outside are really thrashing. They're like out there skating. What do you say? Skate or die. They're out there skating and dying or not dying since they're skating so hard. I hear like kick flips going on out there. So I told you we had set our participants workload at 600 kilograms per minute. So our workload component is right here. And as you see, I already circled 600. So that is the work rate at which this woman was working. So a good habit to get into when you use this is once you circle this, I want you to draw a line to the edge here. Cause if you don't do that, you will mess this up. All right. Now workload is here. And I also told you her steady state heart rate was 144. So we're going to come over here, pulse rate or heart rate. We're going to go to women on this side and we're going to go down and we're going to find 144. And I already did that. I'm going to put a dot right here. Now, in order to determine her VO2, we are going to connect the line from here to here. And if you were doing this on paper, you would get a ruler and you would just basically draw a line. So when I did this, it's essentially going to go right through, I'm going to try to do my best with my right hand here. It's essentially going to go right through to here. And now that tells us that her VO2 is 2.7 liters per minute. And this is an absolute value. Why is this an absolute value? This is not relative. We talked a little bit about relative and absolute. 
what would make this value relative? And you should be saying, oh, her weight is not involved in this. You're right. It is considered an absolute measurement because we are not considering her weight. And if we consider her weight, we have to convert this 2.7 liters to 2.7 we have to convert it to milliliters because then we're going to do, if you think of the VO2, right? VO2 equals what? And we've talked about this many, many times, um, but we got to, it's how many milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute, right? So in order to determine what her relative, I'm sorry, her absolute i'm sorry her relative value is we have to bring in her weight so i didn't give you her weight so let's talk about what her weight is all right so we know that she did a she had a heart 144 which was her her heart steady state heart rate she worked at a 600 um kilogram per meter per minute workload we drew a line that's not a straight line but it's it's okay um we drew a line she's at a 2.7 and now let's convert that information to get in a, a relative score. So we had 2.7 liters per minute. And I said, she's 118 pounds. So the first thing we got to do is take that 118 divided by 2.2 to get kilograms, right? There she is, 53.63 kilograms per minute. We take that 2.7 liters. And in order to convert that into milliliters, we have to multiply it by a thousand. So if we multiply by a thousand, we have 2,700 milli milliliters. Now we got to take that 2,700 milliliters and divide it by her weight and we get a VO2 score. Now, does that make sense that she's got a 50? Yeah, it makes perfect sense because she was working at a 600 work rate, right? So it makes perfect sense. We know she's in shape because she did this higher value, right? If we go back to her value, we know, I'm sorry about that. We know that she did the highest score for a woman. So we know she's a female. She did 600. That's, that's very, very high. And then um, we know that she scored a 2.7 liter uh, score on her estimated VO2. And then we converted that. And here's that conversion. So again, the things you have to take away from this, if we want to convert liters to milliliters, we got to multiply it by a thousand. We get milliliters. And then to make something relative relative to their weight we have to divide it that milliliters by their weight and that gives us a vo2 score so that is this whole process in a nutshell make sure you watch this make sure you guys watch the videos that um i already put up if i were you i would go back and kind of watch some of those youtube videos again now that we went through this you're like oh okay i get it now and um while you guys are doing that i'm gonna watch these guys do some uh backside um nose grinds on the uh curbs out there and do some fakey shove -its and maybe some heel flips so have a good week have a good weekend and i will be in touch soon take care guys